Welcome. Thank you. All right, so this talk is about building reusable Swift UI components, and I've been giving this talk for a couple of times, so maybe show of hands, who here has already seen it? Awesome. <laughs> so it's only just the rest of the speakers <laughs> and people who were in Turin. Um, nevertheless, I completely rebuilt it because I thought it would be boring for anyone here who's seen it before. At the end, I will show you a link to the previous version, but this one is completely rebuilt. And because this is not a Swift talk, but a Swift UI talk, let's use the proper color. All right, so my name is Peter. I am a developer relations engineer on the Firebase team at Google. And now you might be wondering why does a Google guy <laughs> give a talk about Swift UI at an iOS conference? Why this talk? All right, so let me tell you a story about this. So um, before I joined Google, I was an iOS developer, and when I joined Google, I joined the team that used to be the Google Plus team. <laughs> and when they asked me, hey, you know, so I interviewed you for two roles. One was Chromecast, the other one was Google Plus. And I was hoping to be on the Chromecast role, and they said, no, the team thinks you lack experience with media companies, so would you be happy to interview for the um, Google Plus role, and I said, yes. <laughs> that was a white lie, because I was just interested in finding out how much they pay, and if I make it through the interview process, and so on and so forth. The answer is they paid enough, I made it through the interview process, and the team got re into what became partnerships. So we worked with a lot of partners, and after a while, I was bored with um, doing that, and I thought, it's time for something new. Ta-da! Swift UI came out, and I was like, this looks amazing. It seems to make app development so much easier. It would be fantastic to take a UI framework that makes stuff a lot easier and put it together with a backend framework that makes stuff a lot easier so that you make app development as a whole so much easier. So, and Apple also said, you know, the best way to build an app is with Swift and Swift UI. Google's mission with Firebase is to help developers succeed by making it easy to build and grow apps, so why not bring it together? And personally, I think it's a marriage made in heaven. All right, so when I joined the team, I had to build a lot of samples to demonstrate Firebase. So what better way to demonstrate how Firebase works by using SwiftUI because, let's face it, so much easier to build sample apps using SwiftUI than using UIKit. So I got a lot of experience with SwiftUI, and at one point I wrote um, a blog post about Combine and SwiftUI, and that was when APRESS reached out and said, would you like to write a book? And I thought, well, it's a lot of work. Probably not, and then I was like, but maybe I should. So this is why I wrote this book, and now you might be wondering why does it say books? It's because I'm working on a new one, and this is based on this talk, so if you're interested in reading that book, you should subscribe to that newsletter, and then when you do so, you get a 20% discount for the existing book, and you'll know when the new one comes out. All right, enough of the marketing. Let's build a simple component. And this is literally um, a walkthrough how to build an app with Swift UI, but we'll take it a lot further than that. So after building a simple UI, um, simple view, we will go into techniques for composing views. Then we will talk about how you can configure your views, how you can style your views, and how you can distribute your views. All right, so let's start with building a simple component. 
So, but instead of just building a component, let's build this app. Um, you know, I noticed this conference doesn't have a conference app, so what better uh, thing to do than, you know, at least start building one. All right, um, so we have a list of speakers, and all the speakers have their nice picture, they've got a name, they've got their affiliation, and then I thought it would be nice to also have like a profile view where you can see the same information but in a slightly different layout. And this is going to be a really interesting challenge, as we'll see in a moment. All right, so let's begin with file new. And this is what you get when you do file new. So let's first of all rearrange the layout, put the icon to the left by using a H stack. Next, put it into a list. Then remove the padding. Then fetch the data from some data source. And show the people their beautiful faces. All right, so this is what you get when you walk through the getting started experience with Swift UI. Now let's rearrange this a little bit. So we want to show um, the companies that people work at, and it looks a little bit crappy, so we'll have to fix the um, alignments. So let's first align the, um, the labels to the left and also to the top, so it looks more beautiful. And then finally, let's also use some formatting to make the labels stand out a little bit more. All right, so this looks great, but it's not dry. Let's go back. So, you know, this is a really simple screen, really. But, and if you imagine if we put more into the screen, it's going to grow a lot. Currently, it fits on one slide, that's fine. But once we start adding stuff, it will grow and grow and grow. It's, it's going to be really hard to read. Um, and, you know, let's be honest, like this stuff here, this H stack, this should, you know, probably go somewhere else and not be here. Like, it's really distracting. All right, so let's not repeat ourselves. Let's use some of Xcode's refactorings. And Xcode is really famous for refactorings, right? <laughs> so let's not just use extract to subview. Let's also use the move to file refactoring. Let's use the extract to local subview property refactoring. And let's use the extract to local subview function refactoring. Just easy stuff. Let's start with using extract to subview. So here is a line in our list, in our list view. Um, and let's move this to a sub view. So open the context menu, choose the extract sub view refactoring, and ta-da, that's what we get. In some versions of Xcode, you would have the name extracted view highlighted ready in refactoring mode and you could just start typing the name that you really want to use. For example, profile picture list view row or whatever. Um, they stopped doing so. And for a long time I thought it was because maybe the compiler has issues or something like that, but I think they completely turned it off. So what we need to do So first of all, here's, here's this wish list, and it will grow. So um, dear Apple, uh, if anyone here is from Apple, <laughs> this is your wish list. Um, funny story, when I was in Turin, I said, if anyone is here from Apple, um, you know, please take note. And somebody actually signed up, and I thought it was a joke, but he was from Apple. So <laughs> all right, so we need this refactoring. It would be really nice. So let's rename this to avatar view. But now there is another problem. And I don't know if you can see it because the contrast is not high enough. But you know those lines, they don't compile because the user is not in scope. right? The user 
was in scope up here, but when we extracted it, it's no longer in scope down here because we are in a new struct, so that's a little bit disappointing. A proper refactoring should do that for us, so we'll have to do it ourselves. And then adjust the call side. So here is another wish list item. Please make it handle dependent properties. All right, so that was extract subview. Let's move it to a different file, shall we? So we'll call the move to file refactoring, <laughs> except there is none. So we'll have to create a new file, and here is a little trick for you. Use the same name as the view that you want to put in there, because then Xcode will produce all the boilerplate for you, and you can just replace it in there. You know, it's, it used to be a bigger deal before iOS uh, Xcode 15, but now we've got this shiny new preview um, macro here, which makes things a lot easier, so it's no longer such a big deal, but it still saves a little bit of time. All right, boom, there we go. Ah, oh, and we need to fix the preview, apparently, because it needs a parameter. There we go. And we need an extract to file refactoring Apple. All right, so this looks great, but what about those white spaces? So who here has an idea? Why is there a white space around this view? It used to look great in the list, didn't it? It's the same code. Why, why does it look like that? Any ideas? Yep, like that. Yeah. Yep, so the, the outer view is just as big as the content, and the uh, technical term for that is, oh, here we can see it. So if we, you know, in Xcode, if we go into the editor, if we uh, click on the stack, it will um, draw a red frame around it so we can see what's going on. So the technical term is uh, SwiftUI's layout behavior. I don't know if Apple has like official naming for what's going on here. Um, the community has different terms for it. I, I really like the term content hugging, so I think you know, that's, that's something that we can use. And then there's uh, expanding. So let's have a look. Um, and by the way, if you want to read more on this, the documentation has more details about it. So let's have a look at the text. And the text is a content hugging view. It will only consume as much space as it needs for the content, no more. A VStack is a content hugging view as well. It will only consume as much space as it needs for its content. An image, though, is an expanding view, and technically, it should expand to as much room as the, the image needs, but in this case here, we explicitly constrained it by using the frame modifier. If I didn't do that, the image would be pretty big, and since everybody has differently sized images, it would look funny, so that's why I did it. All right. And HTAG is a content hugging view, so overall this is a content hugging view, and that is why we have this funny layout. And the easiest solution for fixing this is to add a spacer, which is an expanding view. It will um, assume as much space as possible. All right. Let's extract to local subview. So if we look at this code here, we can see that you know maybe, you, this is maybe not the best example, but oftentimes in a view, you will have code where you think, oh, you know, I might be using this kind of code again and again and again. Um, but instead of repeating it, well, usually you, you repeat it, so you might be copying it, copy and pasting it. But in this case, Let's make it reusable, so we will um, extract it to a local subview. So, and unfortunately, I might, you might guess it, there is no refactoring for it, really. So we'll have to do it ourselves. So I create a new uh, computed property, 
I make sure that I use an opaque uh, return type of some view. And then I just move it up there and down here I use the title label and the screen looks the same. So firstly, please give us the refactoring. Now let's look at a different situation. So this worked fine because um, you know, we, we really didn't have any extra parameters, but what if you have extra parameters like down here? So you, you, know, you can't just, you know, these two lines are the same except for what's being passed in. So we can't use a computer property, but instead we'll use a function which again returns some view and then we can move this up here, adjust this, and then adjust the call set accordingly, and there you go. All right, so these were some basic refactorings. Now let's talk about the, 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 the deeper principles behind it. So which techniques might you use when you build a view? So what we see here, using the view body, that is what we usually do. We'll just write it down, and that works fine. I showed you how to use local properties to extract stuff from in the view body and put it into reusable pieces of code. And in this, uh, in this case, it's a computer property. So um, you can reuse it multiple times within your view body. Another option is to use functions, um, specifically useful when you need to pass in more than just one parameter. And if you think about it, what these really are are view builders. So what is a view builder? So here's a nice um, article from Antoine, and in this article he says, the add view builder attribute is one of the few result builders available for you to use in Swift UI. You typically use it to create child views for a specific Swift UI view in a readable way without having to use any return keywords. So if you look at that, you will see that, I mean, these are, these are computed um, properties and functions, but still we don't have a return keyword. So this is because they, they are view builders, but why, why is it that I didn't have to use add view builder to mark these up? So let's take a look at a more complicated example to see when we need to use a view builder. And let's use the image. And let's say we want to use either a round or a rectangular image. So we'll just define a property as round. If it's round, we'll use this. And if it's not round, we use the same, but without the clip shape. And the compiler tells us, well, you can't do that because the branches have mismatching types. So here it's self.clipshape, and here it's self.frame, and these are not the same, so the compiler is confused. So one way to do that is to just wrap it into an any view, and that resolves the compile error, but that also removes the view identity and that makes it harder for Swift UI to tell your views apart and that's not a good idea. So instead of doing that, we will just mark them up as view builder. So that will keep the type information. Swift UI will be able to tell your view apart. Um, and this leads us to the answer to when you need to use them, you need to use a view builder attribute if the views that you want to return from either a computed property or a function is structurally different. So if you've got an if clause on there, for example. More details, there are two really excellent articles. Here is one from Tanashita, how to avoid using any view in Swift UI, and there is another one, view builders versus any view by Alejito. All right, let's talk about configuring views. So, 
currently, we need to call the avatar view like this, is round and then passed in a user. And that's not a great API. If you think about how Apple's APIs look like, the initializer is usually very, very sparse. And most of the configuration options come via view modifiers. So let's turn this into a view modifier, shall we? So to build a view modifier, there are a couple of things you need to do. So for this particular case, we need to define an enum to tell it if it's round or a rectangle. Then, and thanks to Emilio for really, uh, you know, teeing this up because he talked about the environment so much, like um, I'll be talking about the environment for the rest of this talk. So we'll first define an environment key so that we can define or track in the environment <laughs> which shape we want to use for, um, for the image. Then we will extend the environment so we can actually write and read from it. And then we will build a view modifier and that essentially writes into the environment and says, okay, the user wants to use this kind of layout for, uh, for the image. And then we can go in and update our view code. So first of all, we can get rid of the is round um, um, property and use the environment to pull this uh, image shape and then just update this conditional clause and there we go. So at the call side, this now looks like this. So I can first of all basically just say avatar image shape dot rectangle and that's what you see on the right hand side. Everybody has a rectangular profile picture now. But the cool thing about the environment is that I don't need to do this within the list. I can do it outside as well. And if you remember what Emilio told us before, everything that you do on the environment basically trickles down the view hierarchy. And if you paid close attention, you will also know that you can overwrite the environment on the inside. So. If you think about this view tree that Emilio talked about, this is on the outside, so this is closer to the root, and we say we want to have rectangular um, shapes, and then here we're on, you know, closer to, to the sky, if you will, in the tree, and here we say, okay, depending on uh, if the user is talking or not, which happens to be the case for me, um, we want to use a round rectangle. And this is why only this one profile picture is round. All right, let's take it one step further and let's register a closure because we might want to tap on the image and open um, an edit dialog. Um, and this again is something that we do in the environment. So first of all, we define the key and here you can see the default value which is an empty closure. We extend the environment so we can read and write from it. We built the view modifier so we can actually register this closure. And then inside the view code, we first need to fetch the closure from the environment into this edit profile uh, handler. And then when the user taps on the hero image, we want to call it, but it might be nil, so we'll need to um, dereference it. Cool. What's it look like on the call side? Easy, like this. So we can just apply the view modifier to our avatar viewer. We could even uh, apply that to um, to an outside view, but in this case, it doesn't make a lot of sense. All right, now let's talk about styling views. So this is from Apple's documentation and it says Swift UI defines built-in styles for certain kinds of views and you might remember that we've got styles for buttons, for example, and for toggles. And then they go on to say, you can override the automatic style by using one of the style view modifiers. So remember that depending on where you run your application, stuff looks different, right? 
you, you put a button and it looks different depending on if you put it into a toolbar or if you run on Mac or if you run on iOS, right? Without you doing anything. So that is the magic inside of Swift UI. But using view modifiers, we can adjust that. So here are a couple of examples for button styles. And you can see that um, there are plenty of styles. There is an interesting point to call out, and it's that the first button doesn't have a style modifier, and the last button has an automatic style modifier, and they look the same. And that is because automatic and nothing at all is literally the same. So automatic is basically the default that Apple registered in the environment. OK, so let's try this ourselves. Let's try to build a custom style for a toggle. So here you see two toggles. This one is the default toggle that we all know and love, uh, thanks to Johnny Ive. And here is a toggle that uses the style that you know from the Reminders app. So how, we, how can we build it? So first of all, we need to define a style protocol. And Sorry, let me go back. OK, so first, the style protocol. So Apple has defined a toggle style protocol, and we need to basically conform to this protocol if we want to implement our own, um, our own style. And the key point is to implement this make body function. And it returns a view. So this is literally our view builder. And it receives a configuration that, that will be important. So here, what we do is we'll use an image. And the image, depending on the state, will either display a circle or a filled circle. And down here, when the user taps on it, we'll basically just toggle the state, which brings us to the configuration. So the configuration is something that's being passed into our style from the view that actually is the toggle. And it gives us all the information that we need. So you see that it has the state for is this on or off, um, and it has a label. So that is why implementing this custom style is as easy as that. So to make it even more useful, we will define a shortcut. So instead of having to always instantiate this style by saying reminder toggle style, um, brace open, brace close, we will just have to say dot reminder. And at the call side, it looks like this. Really easy. All right. Tell me why. Tell me why we're talking about view styling in a talk about reusable Swift UI views. That is probably what you're thinking about. Um, <clears throat> and it's not that I want it that way. Um, but the real reason is this. So this, again, is from the Apple documentation. Um, and here it says, it automatically selects the appropriate style for a particular presentation context. And the context might be the platform you're running on, the container you're sitting in. So you know, if you put a button into a toolbar or if you put it into a form, for example. And your use case, so you might want to use different types of or different looks and feels of your views, depending on what you do. For example, you might want to style your lists as grouped or grouped inset list or a sidebar list, right? So you want to have control over that. And then there is another thing. So here it says it propagates throughout a contain container view. And that is hinting at design systems. So you might want to have a style that is applied across your entire application, you know, specific colors, for example. And that you want to define on, you know, ideally on the root level. And this is why styling views is important for us. And what if I told you that this and this view actually are the same? It's just a different style. So let's first go ahead and implement the left one. 
So first of all, we need to have a configuration. Remember what we did for the toggle view. So here we will build a configuration for our avatar and it needs to contain all the pieces of information that we need to build the avatar view. So we've got a title, um, we've got a subtitle and we've got an image. So we need all of these information in the configuration. The next thing that we need to do is we need to define the style protocol. So Apple hasn't done it for us, we need to do it ourselves. And again, the important piece here is to have this make body function. Next is setting up the environment, and by now you should be able to do this in your sleep, right? So you define the environment key, you define the environment values, and then you extend the view uh, in order to um, be able to um, set this, um, you know, use this um, extension on view to write into the environment to set the style. All right, so now we can implement the style, and if you compare this code to how the code looked before, you will notice that this literally is almost the same kind of, uh, the same code that we used to have in our view body. Just took it, copied it over there, and then replaced everything with the configuration so we can pull those pieces of information from the configuration. But this is the style for our view. And then we need to update our, the code in our, in our view. So first of all, we will pull the style from the environment. And then I replace the body. So first of all, I'll instantiate the configuration using everything that we get from the initializer. And then down here, I will call style.makeBody to tell the style to please produce the look of the view for me. So how does it look like at the call site? So here we have an automatic style. I could completely remove this line because automatic is the default. This is how it looks like. And now that we've got this left one done, we can look at what's needed to implement the right one. So first of all, we need to implement the style and um, the key difference is we're now using a VStack. Things are lined, uh, lined up a little bit differently, but it's really easy to see. And then we define our style shortcut, so now we can use dot profile, and then we are ready to use it. So here we go, avatar style dot profile, and that's what it looks like. All right, so finally, let's talk about distributing views. So to distribute a view, the first thing that you want to do is actually move this view from inside your application into a package. So the first thing that we need to do is create a package using file new package. The key thing is put it into the same folder as your as the root folder of your project, and then Xcode will automatically give you those uh, drop downs for uh, which group to add it to. So make sure that you choose um, the, the the root group in your in your application, and then we can go to uh, our view and use the extract to package refactoring. Mm. <laughs> Maybe not so much. Another item for our list. Okay, but now let's talk about the Xcode component library. Um, and I'm, I have a confession to make. I thought that because I complain about this stuff so much, Apple has removed this feature. They haven't. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks to my fellow uh, speakers for seeding doubt in my mind when I talk, uh, talk, told them about this. So it's a little bit hard to read. Um, but essentially what you see here is Xcode, and then in the top right corner here, up there, who has noticed this plus icon? Okay, half of you. So that opens the component library, and it has a lot of things that are useful if you're looking for stuff. For example, it has a tab with SF symbols, that's super useful. It also has a tab for snippets, and it has a tab for 
Swift components and for Swift view modifiers. So, and if you, you can filter it and you can click on one of those views and here we can see um, the button view, it's got a nice icon and it's got a nice description which is pulled from the documentation and the cool thing is that we can make use of that ourselves. So we can register our view, we can register our view modifiers and we can register our styles by using the library item um, API, just like this. So we can specify um, you know, the view that we want to instantiate, we can provide the default parameters here, um, and we can tell Xcode in which category we want uh, to put it, and uh, the label it should use to show it in the list, and then behold our wonderful view. Um, and no, it's not an accident. There are no details and there is no icon because that's not supported. It's so sad. Okay, so let's move to um, distributing it. So we create a new um, project on GitHub and then we just drag and drop our files into this field. Who knew that you could push stuff to GitHub like that? It's amazing, right? <laughs> Easiest way to set up your project. Um, the important thing is to make sure that the package.swift file is in the root folder and then we can just go in um, our into any project, let's assume we've got a new project where we want to use this view, and we use um, the URL of uh, the project on GitHub that we created, and then we can go in and use it here. Um, if I had a label microphone, I would give a live demo, but using this, it's really awkward. And that is our view that we built, reused in a new application, ta-da! All right, so um, we worked through building a simple component. I showed you techniques for composing views, um, you know, for extracting stuff from your spaghetti monsters into stuff that's actually readable and reusable. We talked a lot about the environment and how we can use it to define view modifiers. I showed you that the environment is at the root of what makes styling or styles work, and I showed you that if you need different layouts of things that look slightly similar, you can use styles to, to implement that, and you know that's really useful because it provides a homogenous user interface for people who use your code. And we talked about distributing views. So I mentioned that this talk is completely new and in the previous version of the talk, I showed how to build a text input field with a floating label. If you're interested in that, I recommend checking out this YouTube series in the middle. The source code will be available in this GitHub repository. Currently it's only just the text input field, but what you saw today will be there in a couple of days. Um, there is another fantastic article series by um, the folks from Moving Parts. Um, highly recommend it. They talk about how, you know, how to build styles and how to compose them. And then if you'd like to give this a try for yourself and build the toggle style yourself, um, I built a Doxy interactive tutorial for building, for recreating Apple's Reminders app using SwiftUI and Firebase. And one module in there is creating a stylable toggle. Um, and that's literally the URL down there. And if you c just can get enough of this kind of stuff, and if you want to see me again, come to iOS Dev UK, which is one of the most brilliant conferences after this one <laughs> in, uh, in Europe or in, in the UK, uh, definitely come there. Um, it's pretty soon, September 4th to 7th. Um, and I will run this as a hands-on workshop using 
a Doxy interactive tutorial. So, hope to see you there. Thank you, Peter. Do we have questions? Thanks, Peter. Okay, so my question is, you showed the library. That was a discovery for me. Never knew you could do that. I don't even recall if you could do that with the uh, UI kit and the storyboards. <laughs> well, uh, th that amazed me. But yeah, the lack of documentation is a bummer. But my question is, if you actually write documentation, does it really not appear in there? No, unfortunately not. So um, you've, you've got a very sharp eye, so you notice that I did not provide documentation. But even if you do provide documentation, it does not show up in the library, which is really unfortunate. Another item to the wish list. True. Thank you. You're welcome. Hey, thanks, Peter. And I'm one of those witnesses from the Turin. It wasn't the same. Uh, so my question is, when do you use computed property? When do you use a struct or another uh, view for any sub-views? Yeah, so I would use a computed property if what you want to access is part of the struct itself. Um, and use a function if you also need to send in additional piece of information. So let's, um, you know, the example that I used was we have one kind of view that, um, you know, only occurs once, and then in that case, it's easy to just use a property. But if it occurs several times, then you not only access something that is in the struct itself, like the user's name or their last name or stuff like that, but you might want to add stuff like, for example, if you dis display a profile, and one detail line is about, this person works at Google. And then the next line is, they are a developer advocate, right? So you've got those, those additional pieces of information. And in that case, you need to use a function because um, works at, that is a string that you only can provide at the call side. But what about the, another struct? Like, just imagine you have multiple texts it's the same structure. You don't need to have if-else or anything else. You can have that one in a computed variable, or you can have a di different view, struct view. Then why not using that instead of just the? Yeah, it, um, I mean, it depends on, on you know, whether you want to keep those things contained in, in this view, or if you want to create even more sub-views that are um, you know, that you can re reuse on, the, on their own, right? So, so there is there's, no there's nothing that could keep you from saying, okay, so this part of my view actually is reusable. Beyond that view, I want to put it into a separate view. So there's no issue having like complex view, which is just one type in a computed variable? Yeah, at least that's what Apple tells okay. us. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't seen any, any to the contrary. Okay. Thank you. By the way, if people have Firebase questions, they can approach me afterwards if they like. I might have stickers. <laughs> Big round of applause for Peter. Thank you.